One of the big stories this past weekend was Eddie Alvarez, the former Bellator lightweight champion, a man who was on this show just a couple months ago saying, I don't care about where this fight airs, what happens, I'm going to go out there and finally realize my dream of becoming a UFC champion. He did it. He called his shot on Thursday. He defeated Rafael Dos Anjos in maybe the most impressive performance of the entire week. And we have the honor of speaking to the new UFC lightweight champion, Eddie Alvarez, right now on the phone. Eddie, how are you? What is up, Ariel? Congratulations, my man. Wow. What an amazing moment for you and, and an amazing moment for those who have been watching you for, for quite some time and have been through your ups and downs. Here we are around four days later. Has it sunk in that you're the UFC lightweight champion? <laughs> uh, no, not really. <laughs> um, it's, it's, I, don't, I don't know. I'm home, man. I just had some breakfast with my, uh, with my family. We go to the same place usually on Sundays, so we just got some breakfast and uh, about to go for a swim with my kids. I don't know, just kind of hanging out. My my uh, my block welcomed me with open arms. I had some balloons and stuff all around my house. And oh wow! I know it's neat, man. Pretty cool. So so when did you get home? I got home. I got home yesterday around seven o'clock, and when when we pulled up, uh, basically like a, a big part of our neighborhood was just sitting outside the house. Wow. Drinking some beers and hanging out. All the kids in the neighborhood were here, and uh, it was really cool. Wow, you're giving me goosebumps. I, I can't imagine uh, what that felt like. Um, uh, Thursday night, I was going to say Saturday night, but Thursday night was the fight. Well, when you got back, when you were away from the press conference and maybe with your wife, uh, your family, your friends, your coaches, I mean, because to me, the story isn't just that you're the champ. It's you overcoming everything. I mean, two years ago, it seemed like you were in purgatory. It seemed like this might not even be a reality for you that you would never even get the chance to fight for the UFC belt. What was that like on Thursday night when you were back, you know, amongst just your your people? It was all quiet, and you're staring at that title. Do you recall? Yeah, you know, I'd look like uh, I went back to the hotel room to meet my wife. I think uh, my, my my two brothers were there with their wives and stuff, and uh, I, I just looked at my wife, and I really was just I was just, I just said to her, I'm like, that just happened. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that just happened. Um, it's just something, it's something we harped on and been working toward and, and talked about and talked about and talked about and obsessed about for years. And, uh, then when it happens, it's like, nah, it was real. I, I guess the cool part of it was just trying to work toward it. Cause then when it finally happens, it just feels like it was supposed to happen. I don't know. Kind of weird. When you were preparing for the fight, dreaming about the fight, working towards the fight, did you think it would go like that? Did you really think it would end that quickly? Um, you know, if, if, when I look back on my career and I, I told people this coming, going into the fight, whenever I get a guy that everybody's, uh, high up about that, he's really dangerous, that he's killing opponents. I, I usually knock them guys out hmm. and it's not, and, and it has nothing to do with, with, um, me being good or me having some certain technique. I get scared. I get, I literally get afraid to the point where my body reacts in ways that it just, it makes for phenomenal performances. So, um, in the past, I've always wanted guys who are super dangerous because, um, my body responds in ways that like surprise myself. And I've always done that, especially against South Poles. Um, every South Pole I ever fought, mostly, I think were my most vicious knockouts of my career. So, um, Dos Anjos was that guy. That's why I said, you know, he probably shouldn't be real violent with me the way he was with Pettis and, and, and these other guys because I react, I respond differently when people attack me like that. Wow. Um, and I think it's just because I'm a little bit afraid, to be honest with you. Wow. <laughs> and when you say afraid, like you, you legitimately mean afraid? Like you, you are more nervous? You're, you're expecting the worst? Like it's, it's very rare to hear a fighter use the a word afraid you're legitimately afraid afraid you're scared you're and and the way um people say that and in in this sport and they look at it as a sign of weakness like oh a fighter shouldn't be afraid and i, I have a line that says be afraid be very afraid because that fear throughout my whole career has gotten me my most vicious knockouts I've ever had. When I was a, when I when I had them nerves, 
and I turn them into, I'm, I'm okay with being afraid. I, I can embrace it. As long as I make the walk and I show up to compete, being afraid is perfectly normal. So um, I just, uh, I think against guys like that, when, when guys are super dangerous, I, I respond differently. There was a nice moment there, or an interesting moment, I should say, when you had him rocked, and then you went for the incredible flying knee. And for a second, I was wondering if that would backfire on you. For, for Looking at it from your perspective, I was like, oh, no, was he a little too aggressive there? What, what was going through your mind? Were you just saying, I got him, I'm going to go for the home run right here? And do you regret? I mean, it all worked out, but in hindsight, was that a mistake? Um, no. Um, the flying knee was something that Dos Anjos' training partner did two fights before ours. So when I was in the back warming up, um, we were working to defend that flying knee because their camp likes to do it. Dos Anjos does it. His training partners do it. And his training partner landed it and uh, put a guy away two fights previous. And I was watching in the back when I was warming up. Wow. And um, when I was watching it, I said, oh, man, if I get him hurt, I'm going to do that. So um, when we were in the fight and he was hurt and there, the scene kind of replayed itself. He started stumbling back. He was going into the cage. I had a lot of space. So I just, I mean, at that point, I'm like, I was sort of in the zone. I just said, ah, let me go for it. Um, I think it'll be something, something cool. And uh, <laughs> just sort of went, went for it. Um, not taking anything away from your previous coaches and teams, but there seems to be something magical brewing between you and, and, and the team now uh, headed up by Mark Hen- Henry. W- w- what's going on there? Why is it working so well for you? It's a, it's, it's a smaller group. Huh. Um, and uh, the, I think I found, I found the way, the, 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 I found the, the right way to do things. And I think eventually MMA will come to this as well because boxing already has. It's one fighter with five, six coaches paying attention to that one guy, and it makes for a way faster learning curve um, when everybody can pay attention and everybody can uh, keep adjusting and and keep communicating. When you have these giant camps, um, it's hard to keep up. How do you pay attention to 40 guys and make 40 guys better? Uh, It's like quality over quantity. So um, we have a very small amount of guys. Um, we have uh, a, a great amount of coaches who have, who are emotionally invested and have the energy and the passion to put into our small group of guys. So um, it's, it's a, it's a mix for success, man, like a terrible mix for success. And uh, we are, um, we're all vibing. We're all pushing hard. And yeah, I think just that small group is, is the key to, uh, to the success. When you were involved with that issue with Bellator a couple of years ago, do you recall a moment where you sort of mentally gave up and said, okay, this isn't going to happen and I have to come to terms with it? And I'm wondering if you did and that makes this moment today that much sweeter. It it does, man. I, the fight, fighting in general, I, I correlate everything in life. You know, like there's times in... And life, there's a bad, there's bad points, and we define them as bad, and then we get down on ourselves, and sometimes maybe we want to quit doing whatever it is we're doing. But uh, and fights are the same way. Uh, you're in a fight, you're in a terrible situation. Maybe your mind goes sour, and you start thinking for a way out. But uh, um, I, the way I fight is the way I like to live my life. So um, I try not to make them any different. You know, if I'm going to not quit in the cage, I'm not going to not quit in my everyday life. If I'm going to be patient inside the cage, I'm going to be patient in my everyday life. So it's really what I what I try to do inside the octagon is it's, it's an expression of who I am. So that's really that's really how I want to fight. Right. I want to just be myself and express who I am. And I think a lot of people appreciate that about you. You do kind of feel like the everyman. Um, the great thing is you have a lot of options now as champion. There's a, there's a big bullseye on your back. Uh, your old friend, Will Brooks, was successful in his debut on Friday. You talked about the easy fight in Conor McGregor after the win. What do you think is going to happen for you next? Do you have any idea yet? Uh, no, no, we haven't. We, I mean, we're so close. You know, the fight just got over with. But um, more than anything... I would just really love for the UFC to come back to Philadelphia. Um, okay. I really want to campaign for that. I really want to push for that. 
uh, if it's not in Philadelphia, like it's somewhere nearby. Um, this town is just screaming at the top of their lungs to have a UFC here. And I think we can sell out the Wachovia Center. We can sell out the, I mean, the Wells Fargo Arena or the the Lea Course. I think it's an easy sellout. Um, I think it's an easy sell for the city of Philadelphia. Okay, so speaking of uh, sales, as the new UFC lightweight champion, I'm sure you heard the news today that the UFC was sold, right? Yes, I have. Uh, when you hear that number, $4 billion, what's your reaction? I, I'm, I want some of that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get me some of that. $4 billion is a lot of money, man. Um, my reaction is uh, I, I, I'm at a position right now where I just want to fight in my city and I want to grab as much of that as I can. I got, I got, I got kids. They got to go to college. I got, I got a lot of, a lot of responsibilities to uphold. So I'm going to get me some. Yeah. So are you looking, are you going to renegotiate? Renegotiate? I, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I have some sitting down to do okay. to figure out what's next. Um, I don't know typically how this process works when you become champion and things like that. Sure. So we have some sitting down to do some discussing to do and figure out who's next and where it's going to be at. And, uh, that's really the only thing that's really important. Now, I said at the top of the show that, uh, my big takeaway was that you guys are worth more than we all thought you were because the UFC is apparently worth $4 billion. Do you feel the same way? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, not, not, a, not, no fighter gets paid enough, man. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're literally, um, people don't recognize it. Even, I don't even think the fighters do, you know, people are, we're putting ourselves and our in danger at risk. There's no amount of money that's ever going to pay enough to say, Hey, I'm going to get inside of a cage and risk my, maybe my retina being detached, never being able to see again or, or risk, uh, you know, my ACLs being torn, never be able to uh, be athletic again. It, there's no amount of money. So, I mean, the more money, the better. Uh, and considering what other athletes are getting paid, you know, we should be at the top of the athlete list getting paid for what we do. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a no-brainer. Are you going to pay close attention to that fight on August 20th? Because I feel like you can, you can, you you have that history with Nate Diaz, and of course Connor. You were on this show talking about him. Spoke about him on Thursday. Uh, is that the one that you're kind of really going to eye for, for what's next for you, the winner of that fight? Oh, hell yeah. Where are they fighting at? Uh, Vegas, August 20th, T-Mobile Arena. I'll be there. I'll uh, be there with a bullhorn uh, <laughs> on the side of the ring. So that's the I'll one you want. I'll be there with a bullhorn to that freak show. <laughs> <laughs> the highest paid, you know, least, least best lightweight uh, in the division. Highest paid. Wow. Bullshit. Um, it is. It's true. It's bullshit. What do you mean? I, these guys. These guys are making dollars. The highest dollars. Uh, they're both. I consider lightweights. I guess making the highest dollars of all of us. And you got guys like Rafael dos Anjos, Donald Cerrone, and myself. Like top, real top level guys who are. Um. You know, we're just kind of getting by. You know what I mean? Yeah. These these two guys need to be taken out and taken out viciously. So uh, we can get some of that money. Uh, are you are you rooting for one over the other? Uh, as far as you're concerned, as far you know, if you get that fight, is there one scenario that you prefer over the other? Uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, look, me and Nate almost got in a fight in Mexico. I think Nate got a little emotional because I was fighting. I was fighting Gilbert Melendez, and at the weigh-ins. You know, he, I don't know, he does what he does, the whole meme mug and shit, and I approached him about it, and I don't think he liked the way I approached him. So, um, we, we have a small history, and, uh, and Connor's Connor. I just think, I don't, I never, I thought Connor was good at the one thing he did, and he is. He's, he's very good at the one thing he's good at. But this is mixed martial arts. You can't, you know, you can't do that. You can't do what he does. You can't fight Dennis Seaver and get a title shot. It's bullshit. Mm. You can't get you can't get knocked out by Nate Diaz and then try to fight Mayweather. This has become a circus. What what what, what is this? I, it makes no sense to me. You got knocked out by Nate Diaz, who is a 500 fighter at lightweight, and then you offer out Mayweather. What kind of nonsense are we dealing with? 
So with that being said, since you're the champion and the standard bearer now, why do you want to give him a title shot? Why not a Habib or a Ferguson, one of those guys? Is it because you... you money. Uh, money, yeah. Money. I don't blame you. Money. <laughs> you get Look, you, you get a small amount of time to share in pay-per-view buys ever. Yeah. yeah. When you have the belt, that's when you get to share in pay-per-view buys ever. So well, what, what makes sense? You know, I'm, I'm no different than the regular working man. Yeah. When I'm, I go out to work... I want to make the most money for my work. I'm no, I'm no different. And and to be honest with you, this division is so stacked. I didn't, I didn't fight Dennis Seaver to get a title shot. I, I literally fought the, the top guys in the division and, and and legitimately worked my way to the top to fight Rafael dos Anjos. I didn't, I didn't fight Seaver and 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 go after these top thirty dudes and get and be given my shot. Man, what a tough road it has been, right? Cerrone, Melendez, Pettis, and then RDA. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a night off. Give me a night off. Uh, who know, do you, pay, me, pay me some uh, vacation time or something. Who do you think wins <laughs> that fight, by the way, the rematch? Who's your pick? Uh, I, think, I, think Nate, I think Nate takes it. Okay. Um, I just don't think, I don't think you can become a five-round fighter in that small amount of time. I think it takes years. I think in boxing, you start off as a four-round fighter, and then you go into six rounds, and you go into eight rounds and ten rounds. They do that because the body doesn't adjust within six months to become a championship fighter. It takes years to be able to build your body and that system to be able to fight and be efficient for five five five-minute rounds. Um, I believe Nate Diaz has the ability to do that. And stay calm and be cool and collective during it. I don't think Connor does. So, no matter how bad the fight gets or or whatnot, I don't think Connor uh, puts Nate away. I don't. I don't picture that happening. I just see even if Connor's being dominant, I see him dumping out at some point and just rolling over. That's 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 what uh, you know. That's what I I can foresee again. Might it, to me, it might be the same exact punch, the same exact way. In oh. my head, when I see that fight going down, I just don't see there being enough time in between the last fight to grow so much and to start making your body move and do things in a different way. I, I don't see it. What do we have? Years for certain things. What do we have planned for you in uh, Philadelphia the next few days? Are we getting a parade? Are we going to go to the the Phillies game and get serenaded? How how is Philadelphia going to treat you know its its champion coming home? What's planned? Uh, yeah, um, I, I have a I have a, um, a talk with a with a councilman today. Oh, about doing about doing a uh, doing a parade on like Broad Street or something like wow. that. So, um, we're gonna we're gonna speak and then see what you know what their ideas are and what they have in mind and then you know mo- mostly anything. I'm, I think I'm headed down to Jersey Shore this weekend with my wife and kids to just relax and chill out. Okay, these last four months been. A lot of sparring rounds. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you, you you spoke about that uh, 150 plus. Amazing. Um, and 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 I owe you a visit, right? You could put me on blast right now, so we have it on the record, right? Do you want? Do should we do it? I mean, I know you're a little bit disappointed in me, and I, and I'll take that. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's put it out there. So to the listeners. Yeah. I've been asking Ariel for for uh, maybe over a year now to come visit to have our walk in Philadelphia. Yep. I honestly think he's scared to walk around the streets of Philadelphia. <laughs> but um, I've been asking him, and he's been promising me, saying, yeah, 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 yeah. And the only time the guy calls me is when he wants an interview. So oh, that's I not put true. him on blast. Okay. I, told him, I told him, you come to Philadelphia, and I'll give you an interview. So where, where, when, it, when, is it, when is our deadline for you to make it to Philadelphia? Well, initially I said the New York event, but you wanted sooner, so I said by October 1st. So you guys heard it. Yeah. Before October first, you will see a walk through the streets of Philadelphia with me and Ariel Hawani. I'm sure he's going to bring a bring a security guard. So Stop he's a it. Bit nervous. Are you kidding? Through, I'm from the mean streets of Montreal. The- <laughs> <laughs> Over here, yay! Philly's the new Iraq, man. You got to oh, watch out. Jeez. <laughs> um, on second thought, I'm going to back out again. Uh, no, but I owe you, and uh, I know you don't believe me. I know actions speak louder than words for you and and they should so i will leave it at that i put it on the show it's now for the world to see and i will back up my words um eddie i appreciate you coming on though i really do thank you thank you and uh congratulations man so happy for you and your family enjoy the belt very well deserved 
Hey, for everybody who's been watching me since MFC Bowdog, wow. Audi fighting all them. You there, Eddie? Oh, it went down there? Dang. He was just about to thank everyone. L let me just give him that, that moment. I was about to get goosebumps there. I think he's been fighting since 2003. MFC Bodog. Eddie, are you there? Hello. Eddie, we lost you just as you were thanking everyone. I want to give you that opportunity. Thank you, man. Hey, I just I was just saying for everyone to follow me during reality fight in Bodog in Atlantic City and have all my, my colored t-shirts and everything like that. Thank you guys so much for the support throughout the years and uh this journey is uh we're just we're just beginning, man. Let's uh let's uh, make some history, take on the best in the world and uh thanks. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Eddie. Thank you for coming on. All right, brother. There he is, Eddie Alvarez, the new UFC lightweight champion. Amazing story, and like I said, very, very well-deserved.